as soon as I got on campus, I said to uh, one of my, um, my traveling companions here is to make sure that I got a hat. And sure enough, there was one in the green room in the back. So it's lovely to be here. And thank you all very much. Of course. Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight, Chef Keller. It's truly an honor to have you on campus. Thank you. And I think that's probably safe to say that you have a very welcoming audience. Everyone here has either dined in one of your restaurants, fantasized about dining in one of your restaurants, <laughs> or heard their significant other fantasize about dining in one of your restaurants. And it's actually quite fitting for me, because my fiance, Ben, is in the audience. And yeah. he has heard me fantasize about dining at the French Laundry for years. Ben, where is Ben? OK. <laughs> I so think I'm, you just got your traveling orders there, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that this helps build my case for actually getting to the French Laundry one day. Good. I hope so, too. We'll Great. do everything we can. <laughs> so it all started with dishwashing. Your first exposure to restaurants was washing dishes in one of your mom's restaurants. Yep. Can you talk about how that first sparked your interest in cooking, and then also what later drove you to commit your life's work to cooking? Well, it, it's interesting because as a youngster, my mother ran restaurants. So uh, being the youngest of, of, of five boys, uh, I, find my, I found myself in the restaurant uh, after school um, doing odd, odd things. And certainly at a young age, you, know, you weren't allowed to, to hold a knife or be anywhere near the fire. So the, the most obvious and safe place to put me was in front of a dishwashing machine where you know, looking back at that time, I really learned so many skills that benefited uh, me in becoming a really, really good cook. And, and just to explain a few of those, when you think about it, you know, being in a dish, dish machine, you have to be, you have to be organized. You know, so setting out all these sample plates on the dirty dish drain board so that as the waiters came back, they put the dishes in the right spots, they put the glasses in the right spot, the silver in the right spot. Uh, you had to be efficient in the way you stacked the plates and, and, and washed the dishes and got the, uh, the glasses done and putting them in the racks correctly uh, so that when you put them in the machine, the machine would wash them. And of course, th by that, 45 seconds later, you knew uh, through the feedback whether the, the, the job that you had done was going to be satisfactory. In other words, the dishes either came out clean or they came out dirty. So if they came out dirty, you know you didn't do your job correctly. So the feedback was very important. And then the idea that you really had to be part of a team. You know, a, a, as a dishwasher, most of us, you know, think, think of that as a, as a really lowly position. But everybody in the entire restaurant relies on you. Mm -hmm. You have to give the dishes back to the cooks. They, they need their dishes in order to plate the food. Uh, the wait staff or the bartenders needed their, their glasses. And of course, the wait staff needed the silverware. So you really had to be a team player. Uh, and that was really important. So you learned how to be part uh, of a team that relied on you to do your job correctly. And of course, there's this idea of some, 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 some rituals. And the rituals were also important. You had to empty the dish machine you know, every three hours and fill it up with clean water. You had to sweep the floor at certain times uh, throughout the night. You had to empty the garbage at certain specific times. And you had to do these things. So rituals played a big, important part of that. And over the overarching, that was repetition. You did it over and over and over and over and over and over again. So you really got very good at it. And, and when you translate that to what a cook does, it's basically the same thing. We're, we're, we have to be organized. Uh, we have to be efficient. Feedback is really, really important for us. I mean, when, when we're heating up oil in a saute pan to, to, to cook a piece of fish, and you put the fish in there, you know right away if the, if the pan was too hot, if the pan wasn't hot enough, has enough oil, or doesn't have enough oil. Right away, you get the feedback on how, on how that ingredient is reacting in that pan. And of course, rituals were important. You have to do things at specific times of the day to get set up for service, which begins at 5.30. And, and repetition. I mean, repetition was such an integral part of becoming a good cook. You know, learning how to slice an onion. You've all seen chefs on TV do the onion thing really, really quick. And you go, how do they do that? We do it because we've done it 10,000 times. That's how we do it. And you can do the same thing. It's not hard. Uh, so when you think about washing dishes, it really set the tone for me becoming a, a, a really good cook. Interesting. And then what was the later experience that ultimately convinced you that you wanted to commit yourself to cooking? Well, for the, for, for the first several years of cooking, my mother came to me one day and said, you know, the chef is leaving. You're going to be the chef. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. <laughs> I was a dishwasher yesterday, and, and, and I'm going to watch this guy who's in this small private yacht club in Palm Beach, and I'm going to do what he does. Well, fortunately, I have an older brother who, 
who really embraced cooking at a young age, and he was already a, a, a professional cook, so he became my first mentor. But it wasn't until 1977 when I met a, a French uh, chef in Narragansett, Rhode Island, where I was working at a private club. And, and the job that I had at that time was cooking for the staff, which was kind of a lowly job, right? You weren't, you weren't doing the elegant food for the guests who were paying you know, high prices to come to dinner. Uh, I was cooking for, for the team there. And it's a summer job. So you have all these young people who are on summer break and they're in Narragansett because they can go to the beach in the afternoon and they can work at night and they have places to live. And, uh, and, and so but the interesting thing about it was, you, again, the feedback. The feedback was really important because when I would cook something for them, believe me, they, they were very vocal about whether they liked it or not. Right? I mean, right away, this was good or this was bad. And, and fortunately, I was, I was a pretty good cook by then, so most of the things I made for them were, were really good. And, and the chef came to me, and he was, very, he was very happy because typically his staff cook wasn't somebody who had the dedication or the skills that I have, and, and, and the other staff was always unhappy. And, and he made the connection for me on why, why cooks cook, why any cook cooks. And it's, it's to nurture people. And, and, and when he said that to me, I thought, that is, that's, that's what I want to do. That was something that resonated with me. The idea that I could do something that would nurture others and give, mm -hmm. them, give them not only sustenance, but give them pleasure was the reason I be, became a chef. So July 1977, I said, this is my job. This is what I'm going to do. And from that right. point on, um, I was dedicated to, to really learning my, cra my, learning my craft. And, uh, and it takes a long time. Uh, you know, it wasn't until much later in life. So that was when I was, you know, 21 years old, and it wasn't, it wasn't until I was really 39 that I start, started to see any kind of financial success or, mm -hmm. or rewards from from the work that I had been doing all those years. I like how often you're referencing feedback because here at the GSB <laughs> we say that feedback is a gift. It, it is, and all yeah. of us receive a lot of it. So yeah. we can certainly empathize with you. Yeah. It's a good thing. So they, you moved on with no formal training and that you didn't go to culinary school and basically had different jobs and apprenticeships. Looking back and recognizing the success that you've had, how much of that do you think is innate versus learned? Ah, good point. I think that, you know, we, we look at our, our, our early child life and I think that we have a, a, a lot of things. And, and certainly I think all of you have got, had gotten great advice from your parents or somebody that was meaningful for you because you're all, you're all here at Stanford. I mean, you know, you just don't show up without having some guidance uh, on that. And I think at, at early in my life, um, again, my, my parents were divorced, so I grew up with a, with, a, with a single parent, and that was my mother. And I was very thankful uh, that I grew up with my mother because she had uh, an attention to detail, uh, a, a work ethic uh, that um, became part of who I was because mm -hmm. she exemplified that every day. And it was through those, example, those, those examples that again, I, I, I find myself looking back to and saying, you know, there is the foundation uh, of my success is, is on, in that early age of understanding what, what expectations were, how to reach them, or how to exceed them in, mm -hmm. in many ways, and, and, and the amount of dedication and work that you had to contribute to actually do that um, was, was, for me, it was, it was a pleasure. Uh, I, I would yeah. get excited by it, and to the point where I remember one time, and 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 it was back when 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 people had um, kind of fake um, foliage, fake trees in their house. So my mother had this wonderful kind of Japanese maple tree that was plastic, and I thought one day I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to really clean the whole thing really good. So I pulled the whole thing apart and I cleaned every leaf and every branch, and I had it all over the floor, and and then I thought. Get this back together again. <laughs> <laughs> she was happy that I cleaned it, but she was very upset that we weren't able to put it back together again. <laughs> <laughs> so, oftentimes at school, we discuss how to respond to setbacks. And the first restaurant that you opened, Raquel in New York, mm -hmm. closed when the stock market bottomed out in the um, end of the 1980s. Yeah. What was the hardest part of that experience for you? I, I think the hardest part of that experience is realize that your, your ultimate dream and, and your ultimate goal, which was so so close and in many ways was in your grasp was, was something that w could, could just disappear um, mm -hmm. without, without something that you, you, you had no control over it. As hard as, as hard as you worked, as dedicated as you were, as great a job as you did, 
at, at that point, there, there was nothing that I could do um, outside of changing the, the format of the restaurant um, to, to, to make myself happier, to make the restaurant successful. Yeah. Um, so it was a choice, and, and I had a great partner, uh, Serge Raoul, um, and he had a very successful restaurant not too far uh, away, across town in, in Soho. And we had the choice to either to, 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 uh, to um, uh, establish a, a more of a casual restaurant. Like because a bistro. This, yeah, it was like a bistro. It was like th this was when you know, fine dining became something that was uh, unapproachable anymore. People weren't willing mm -hmm. to pay for it. And so everything was becoming casual. And so we could casualize Raquel. Um, I could stay there as a partner and as the chef, or I could give it up and, and pursue my goals. And I was, I was so determined uh, that fine dining was, was gonna be my venue that I, I, I separated myself from the restaurant that, believe me, I mean, when we were building the restaurant, the contractors would come in in the morning and, and they, would, they would do their work and the place would be a mess. And every night, I would clean the restaurant, knowing that the contractors would come back the next morning and make it a mess again. I mean, there were nights I would sleep in the restaurant. This was, this was, this was, this was my life. This was going to be my restaurant. This was, this was my future. Mm -hmm. And and to, to five years later realize that it wasn't going to be anymore, and that New York City, which was, which again was my life and the center of the universe, the universe for me, wasn't gonna wasn't gonna be the place that I was going to be was was devastating. But what are your choices? I mean, at the end of the day, you're faced with a choice. You know, e either you can do something, you can compromise on what your goals are. You know, I could have casualized the restaurant and been there and, and, mm -hmm. and been miserable. Um, or I could, have, I could have left and, and, and pursued my true goals of, of fine dining and, and, and hopefully finding that, that avenue that would lead me to, to success. And it, that was in 19... 90 when I, when, I, when I left Raquel uh, and moved to Southern California. And did you take any lessons from that experience? Maybe that would help you preserve yes. fine dining? Yes, big but... lessons, big lessons. I knew that, you know, I realized that, that I didn't know everything. I mean, you know, it's, at some point in my life, I thought I knew everything. I thought I knew how to run a restaurant. Um, but I realized that I was a really good chef. I was a really good cook. Uh, I had no idea about finances. And I, I knew nothing about, uh, you know, I couldn't read a P&L. And I, I didn't know how to run a dining room. And, and those are a big part of a restaurant, you know, certainly a big part of any business, you know, in terms of financial. Uh, so when I, when, I, when I was able to buy Raquel, I was able to, to buy French Laundry, I realized that I needed somebody in the dining room that mm -hmm. could focus on the dining room, that was an expert on the dining room, and I needed somebody, you know, who could take care of our financial. And so it became a tripod. There was me in the kitchen focused on the food, which was really my expertise. I mm -hmm. realized that was my expertise, that was my strength. And I need to play to my strength and, and find those individuals who could compensate for my weaknesses. Yeah. And so Laura Cunningham became the general manager of the restaurant. Uh, we had a, a, a young bookkeeper named Pat McCarthy, and she took care of all of our financials. And that's what the basis and the foundation of the success of the French Laundry was. And it sounds like you all kind of respected each other's boundaries and well, it, it, we were so busy that there was there was no real choice. Yeah, and, you know, we had to stay focused on on our different departments. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after 1994, when you opened the French Laundry, your presence on the culinary scene just has exploded in terms of opening up Bouchon and Bouchon Bakery, Per Se, Ad Hoc, et cetera. Um, all of those restaurants include different locations, different cuisine, different clientele. What have been some of the driving factors behind each decision to open a new restaurant? OK, uh, good, good question. But I just, I just want to, just if I can, just yeah. segue back to, to, to French Laundry because, you know, it's something that's very important for me to, 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 to tell you is that, it, for, as, as we was pointed out, it was 19 months I was raising money for the French Laundry. Now, you know, looking back at that time, I realized that my biggest asset was my ignorance. Had I known what it was going to take to actually raise the money and buy that restaurant when I began the process, it would have been overwhelming for me. I would have never done it. What really drove me forward and, and, and kept me motivated were small successes every so often. Um, I was in a position where I'd closed Raquel. Um, I was labeled you know, somewhat of an emotional chef, uh, which can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Um, <laughs> And, and I, I, had, 
I was unemployed and living in Los Angeles, and I found this restaurant that I fell in love with. And I said, there, there's my, my dream. There's where I should be. There was an instant connection for me. And I decided that I was going to try to purchase the restaurant. But I, I had no resources. I, I had no money. I had no job. And it was really through, through perseverance and through so many other individuals around me that were supportive of that process that we, we were able to accomplish it. But it was really the unknown that protected me uh, so well in, 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 that, in raising that money. And um, every day I would wake up and I would make, make phone calls or try to fill out forms. And, and to think about that time in my life and you know, talking to over 400 people that I didn't know and asking them for money. I don't know how many of you have actually called people you don't know and asked them to write you a check. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing, but in the same time, it reinforces, it, it, re, it reinforces your, your ideals and, and really what you want to do because you say it over and over and over again, what you're trying to accomplish, and to the point where if you didn't believe it when you started, you certainly believe in yourself at some point along the road. <laughs> And then to deal with, with banks, and, and, I, and I'm sure all of you have dealt with banks before, um, but it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult process um, is to try to get people, a bank, to, to write you a check. And then the federal government on, uh, on an SBA loan, a small business administration loan, was also somewhat of a challenge knowing that a, a white middle class uh, male was applying for a small business loan when they would give it to to, to more or less minorities um, was also an accomplishment. So the, the ignorance factor played a very important part in, in my success. Getting to your question about the, the, different, the different restaurants around, mm -hmm. around the country and what drove, drove me to open more restaurants, oh, in the beginning it was, it, was, it was always about the French Laundry and, and how to make the French Laundry better was always our goal. Now our first restaurant we opened was Bouchon, which is just two blocks south of the restaurant. And the reason we opened Bouchon was so that we could have a place to eat. I mean, I, I, it's, honestly, I mean, we, there was a very small group of individuals at the French Laundry when we opened. Most of us came from urban environments where we could go out after work and get something to eat, whether it was in San Francisco, LA, or, or, or New York. We were used to that, finishing work at midnight and then going, going for dinner. And in Napa Valley at that time, everything closed at 9.30. Yeah. So what do you do? You open a restaurant that stays open late. And fortunately, we had already gar garnered a certain amount of, uh, of respect and admiration from, from not only the press and from the public, but also from the partners that we had. So when I proposed opening a French bistro in Yonville, um, you know, it took me 18 months to raise 1.2 million. It took me 18 days to raise 1.5 million. So it just goes to show you success breeds you know, success and interest in, in what you're doing. Um, and we opened Bouchon. But we opened Bouchon because it gave us an opportunity to have a place to eat. Now, I knew at the same time that if my little restaurant needed a place to go to eat after work, and Napa Valley being a center for hospitality, and what that means is there's, there are so many restaurants in Napa Valley, as well as hotels. Everything is based on hospitality. So if we need a place to eat, then, then there are obviously dozens of others or hundreds of other people who would love to have a place to eat as well. And so that was speculation, but obviously it paid off because the restaurant stayed open to 1 o'clock in the morning, and it was packed every night uh, with, with who? With hospitality workers. Yeah. Um, the next thing we opened was Bouchon Bakery. And we opened Bouchon Bakery because, really, again, because of the French Laundry. Uh, and in, in Northern California, as you know, we have probably the, 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 the largest population of the most amazing artists and bakers in America. We just do. They all, they all travel to Northern California. And so we, had, we certainly had our, our pick of great bread, but none of them would bake bread specifically to not necessarily the standard we wanted, but the size, the shape, or the variety. So what choice did we have but to open our own bakery? So we opened a bakery to supply bread for the French Laundry, and obviously the byproduct of that would be supply bread for Bouchon. And if you're going to open a bakery, why don't you open a little retail area so people can come and, and get morning breakfast? So we built a little, a little, a little uh, retail area, and there's a little courtyard there where today it is, it, it's a community center. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a wonderful thing to go down there in the morning time and see people sitting around in the morning having their coffee, their croissant, and engaging 
with other people. Uh, you know, it, it's really created this, this, this community of, of, of individuals, whether they're our neighbors, whether they're our friends, or the visitors that come to Napa Valley. It's, it's a wonderful experience. Um, but it was, really, it was really the genesis for, for French Laundry. So the first expansion that I would really classify as expansion happened in 2004. It's 10 years after uh, we opened the French Laundry. I opened a restaurant in New York City called Per Se, mm -hmm. and a restaurant in Las Vegas called, uh, or a, a second Bouchon in Las Vegas. Uh, so that's where I really, really we, we thought about expansion because it was outside of that, of that immediate, geography, the immediate geography of the French Laundry or what, what was right there, what I could control very easily because they were right down the street. And why per se, though? Well, it's a very, it's a very, you know, it's a very easy question to answer. I mean, if I asked that question to all of you, if you lived in New York, if you began your career in New York, if you've gotten some notoriety in New York, and you knew you had friends in New York, you knew the media in New York, and you had suppliers in New York, where would you go to open your your, your next restaurant? You'd go to a place where you, they knew you. So going back to New York for me was an obvious choice. But but also, my, you have to understand, my my life has been been very interesting, and I kind of separate myself from. From, from, from Thomas Keller many times, so I can kind of look at it. Um, but when I moved to California and I became, became successful you know, at, in, in, at the French Laundry, you know, all my, my, my previous guests you know, and friends in New York said, well, when are you coming home? It's like, coming home? What, what does that mean? I was born in California. So when I came to California, in 1990, you know, everybody thought I was coming home to California. So it kind of, this idea of me being back and forth, and you know how LA and California have this kind of uh, comp competitive edge with each other. So when I moved to California from New York to California, people thought, well, I'm Californian, so it's okay. Although I never really lived in California. When I, when I got the French Laundry, as I said, New Yorker said, when are you coming home? So it really, again, gave me more confidence to go back to New York because yeah. New Yorkers thought I was from New York. <laughs> So per se, was, per se was born. And it was a very interesting process as well. It was, it was a, a three and a half year uh, um, uh, project, which began in, in mid-2000 and, and opened in, in, in 2004. Um, and saw a lot, of, a lot of difficulty. Obviously, one of the big setbacks was 9-11 and, and realizing that um, you know, New York had changed dramatically after, mm -hmm. after that catastrophe. And, uh, and, and, and persevering through that process, finally opening the restaurant, and then we had a devastating fire in the restaurant, which closed the restaurant. Um, and it was, a, it, it was a very, as much as we had spent uh, a lot of time organizing the restaurant, designing the restaurant, building the restaurant, staffing the restaurant, we closed the French Laundry. This was, this was a business decision that I made <clears throat> late in the process. And, and, and it was interesting because um, I, I didn't think of it. And, 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 and you realize that, that those individuals that are around you, I, I always listen to people, and, and I always like the idea of team, and I like the idea of collaboration. And many of the ideas that I have aren't necessarily my ideas. Um, they're other people's ideas. And I think one of the things that, I, that I'm able to do is give others the confidence and courage to express ideas. I think we've all been in those environments where where, where we've, we've been either prevented or we're afraid to, ex to express our ideas to, to, to our supervisors. I, I try to give the opportunity for anybody to say whatever they want, as I want them to have an impact. And there was, there was a woman at the time when I was building, per se, and that was with us that was actually doing a, her, her doctorate uh, thesis for the other school in, in California, we won't name it. Um, and she spent two years with us studying the, um, the, 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 our, our business um, and, uh, at, at French Laundry. And she, she actually published a book on it. Um, and, and she became a close friend. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I was opening Per Se as it relates to how I was going to open Per Se and maintain and continue to operate the French Laundry. And she got to know me so well. Uh, we would sit and talk, and we were sitting in the garden one day, and she said, Thomas, you know, I know you've been struggling with this, but it's, it's very obvious to me what you should do. I said, Rebecca, what is that? She said, just close the French Laundry. I thought, wow, what an idea. Just close the French Laundry. Now, from a business point of view, you're going to close a restaurant that's doing, you know, over a million dollars a month in business, and you're, you're going to close it for five months to go open another restaurant, which has nothing to do with the partners of the original restaurant, right? I mean, so you're a partner of the French Laundry. You're going, wait a minute. Why would you, why, why would you do that? 
Well, we're, we're going to do that for a number of different reasons. We're going to do that because if we do this successfully in New York City, it's going to have a very positive impact on, on the French Laundry. It's going to give us the opportunity to really have this, this cultural exchange between two restaurants that has never been done before. So we did that. We closed the French Laundry. We moved 30 individuals, like Noah's Ark. We moved 30 <laughs> staff members from the French Laundry from different departments that were intended to go to New York temporarily to help inoculate this team in New York, and then they'd come back and open the French Laundry. And that's exactly what we did. And, and to this day, it, it established such a strong foundation for, for that restaurant uh, that almost immediately it became one of the best restaurants in New York City and ultimately one of, considered one of the best restaurants in the country. Now, you could, you could argue a lot of different things. Could we have done that without that? Well, there's this idea, certainly in the media as it relates to chefs, that we spread ourselves too thin. Has anybody heard that expression? Right. Oh, that chef's spreading himself too thin. I don't know, he's opening another restaurant. That's not a good thing for him to do. They don't say that about any other businesses, do they? I mean, Hermes can open as many shops as they want without somebody saying, well, Hermes is spreading himself too thin, right? I mean, you think about, you think about retail or you think about general commerce, and most people think, well, you should just continue to grow. But when it comes to restaurants and chefs, mm -mm, it's a bad thing. And I tried to explain it's, that That is such... <laughs> I'm trying to, it's, 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 it's so wrong when you think about it. <laughs> you could have said what you actually. It's so, it's so wrong, sorry, it's so wrong. Because when you think about it, if I have the French Laundry where there's 100 employees, there's 100 staff members, right? And they're all focused, they have, a, they have the common vision, we have common goals, we're achieving great expectations, we're, we're, we're exceeding our standards, we're doing all the things right. We open per se and I've got 150 employees there who are doing the same thing. So now I have 250 people that are working for me that are all folks. How, am I, how have I become weaker? How have I stretched myself too thin? I mean, we've become that much stronger by opening another restaurant. So it really, it really you know, this idea that, you know, there, I, I must admit that some of my colleagues may be doing, doing things other ways that don't really enhance or strengthen their, their businesses. But if you do it correctly, if you really think about it, you do it for the right reasons, I mean, you, we become so much stronger. We were able to exchange, you know, I've always worked towards this exchange program. We've always continued to exchange staff. Well, last summer, we exchanged our chef to cuisines, right? The heads of the kitchens from the French onion per se, they got on airplanes at the same time, went to each other's restaurants, right? For 15 days. They walked into each other's restaurants and operated each other's restaurants without a problem. Now, we, we built up to that because as Eli came to Yonville, he was walking into a restaurant where Matthew was. Now, Matthew had worked for Eli in New York and came to, to Yonville, right? So he, he's walking into an area where Mike Wallace was there. Mike Wallace worked for, for, for Eli in New York. Timothy was walking into a restaurant where Nick was there, who had worked for Timothy in Yonville. So we have this wonderful exchange program where we've built this, the, the, this culture of, of knowledge and the ability for, if you're a young chef, you can come to French Laundry and work in this beautiful idea like Napa Valley. And when you get tired of that, you know, we'll send you off to New York City, this vibrant and exciting you know, place in New York, and you can go, go to work there. So th this idea of this exchange that we have has created a, a, bond, a bond between the restaurants that, is, that, that exchanges knowledge. So you think about evolution, we all talk about evolution. Well, we have a rapid rate of evolution because now, no longer do we have just 100 people thinking about something, we have 250 people thinking about something. So our evolution is, 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 is just goes at such a pace, it's hard to keep up sometimes with what's going on in our restaurants because there are, everybody's exchanging ideas. Uh, and then we become strong. We become, the strength of our restaurants is, is, is extraordinary when I look at, when I look at this. And, and I've said, you know, it's almost like a, I run, a, I run a sports franchise is the way I describe it um, because we have to be thinking generation, generationally about who is coming up, who's going to be replacing who and how we're going to do that, how we're, ment how we're hiring, how we're mentoring, how we're training our staff so that they can become, sooner or later, can become the franchise player uh, and, and ultimately then let them go and become, become their own business. You know, that's, that's the ultimate goal is to actually push them out so that they can start their own restaurants. Uh, and be successful on their own. So at the beginning of what you were just describing, the hiring piece, yes. 
what are the top three qualities that you look for when hiring new talent for one of your restaurants? Desire, desire, and desire. <laughs> I mean, you were quoted saying that it's desire that really matters. It's yeah. not passion because yeah. passion yeah. is yeah. fleeting. People talk about passion. You know, I, 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 it, sometimes it drives me crazy. You know, some of the some of the, the vocabulary that we use in, in people's house. A young Coco country, I say, so why do you want to work here? Oh, Jeff, I'm so passionate about what I do. You just don't believe the passion I have. I mean, every morning I wake up, I'm so passionate about this. I'm thinking, okay, whatever. This kid just doesn't, doesn't understand. It's wonderful to think it like that, right? Think that you're going to be passionate about your job all the time. But we all know, I mean, passion ebbs and flows. I mean, if you've ever had a relationship with somebody, I mean, <laughs> I mean there, therein lies the perfect example of, you know, how, how passion goes. I mean, we're passionate about somebody who, you know, for a while, and then it, then it kind of subsides, and then you know, it reignites for some reason. You know, it, it's all over the place, right? Um, and and if you relate that to food, I mean, you know, the the first asparagus of the spring, which we saw three weeks ago, is like, wow, it's amazing. I haven't seen it all year long, and it's like, I love it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about doing something with asparagus. But what happens three weeks later when you've seen asparagus every day for the past three weeks? It's like, okay, whatever. You know, it's just another bundle of asparagus. I got to do something with it. <laughs> So what, what, what keeps you going? It's, it's the desire. It's the desire to do something with the asparagus. It's the desire to be with that person that, that, that keeps you with that person. Because if it was all based on passion, we'd have a different partner every other year, right? It's the desire to, to do something that really drives us. So that's what I look for, is I look for that desire. I know that there are levels of skill that some people are born with, and, and some people will be stars, and some people won't. And, and, and it breaks my heart to, to see those young individuals that are in our restaurants, whether they're in the kitchen or in the dining room, who have this strong desire to do a good job and they just don't have the skills to do it. That, that, that's really heartbreaking. And we try to f find places for them where they're going to succeed. Maybe it's not at the French Laundry. Maybe it's at Bouchon. Maybe it's at a colleague's restaurant. Um, and then, and then those, the, those ones who, who have amazing skill and, you know, they could be a star, but, you know, they just, they just don't have the desire. And, and that breaks your heart because you, you just want to you slap them in the face. And, you know, you are so good. How come you don't you apply yourself more? Um, so so really it's, it's about desire. Is know? there a question you ask in interviews to tease out whether someone has no? We, you know, it's what we what we the way we interview is we have them in our kitchen. You mm -hmm. know, if we're talking about a culinary person, we, we want them to come into our kitchen for for two different reasons. We, we want to watch the way they move. It's a, it's a dance. You know, I mean, let's face it, in a kitchen that is that is crowded with people. Um, and you know everybody's moving at you know at, at intense speeds. Everybody's focused. Um, it's it's about how you move in a kitchen. So we want to really see how how they're moving. And, and 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 sometimes it's an innate thing as well, understanding who's behind you, how you feel about about being close with people. Because we touch every you know it's it's, it's like a basketball game. You're, you're constantly touching somebody. You know, and if if people don't like to be touched, that's a problem. But making but having them in the kitchen gives gives us two opportunities. It gives us an opportunity to to see how they move through the kitchen to see how they react to others in, mm -hmm. in the kitchen, and you know, to give them some basic skills. You know, here, here, here's, here's an egg, scramble an egg, or you know, here's some vegetables, chop an onion, or things like that. Uh, we, can all, we can teach almost anything if somebody has a strong desire to do it. But the other important thing during that aspect is for them to actually see the kitchen themselves. And we want them to answer the question, do I think I can work in that environment? Mm -hmm. So they know what they're getting themselves exactly. into. Exactly. And, and, and you'd be surprised how many people realize that they can't work in that environment. It's too intense, it's too quick, it's too difficult. Uh, it requires too much dedication. The hours are too long. I mean, all these different things that come into, into effect. Mm -hmm. You can look at somebody's resume, they come out of school, they're, they're, they're recommended by, by somebody. And, and yes, I mean, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a gamble. You, 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 know, you flip a coin. We've had, we've had very successful chefs who've come from, I mean, Timothy Hollingsworth, who came from, from basically nowhere, uh, 13 years ago, began working at the French Army and became the chef de cuisine without any any formal education as well. Um, his whole education was at the French Laundry. Uh, as, as a young, he came at 21 years old. He just he left last week. He came in as a commis, which is the lowest level position in the kitchen, and he left at the highest level in the position, with you know with the respect of, of an industry um, comp competed as the Buku store captain who placed higher for the U.S. than any other team had ever done, and his only experience in the kitchen was at the French Laundry. And he got there by accident, because my chef that was in at the time, Eric Ziebold, didn't want to hire him, and, and I, didn't, I didn't realize that he didn't want to hire him, so I hired him, and he gets in the kitchen. 
<laughs> and, 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 and so you just never know. Um, but, but you have this, you, you have other people who have great resumes, who come from mm -hmm. great houses, and, and, and they just, they fall. They, they, they fail. So it's, it's yeah. hard to really tell. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important process in hiring. We, we, we have to spend our time making sure that we're trying to identify the right person for the right job. I mean, that, that's an important thing. And, and back when I was young in, in, in the business, it was about being in the right place at the right time. You know, mm -hmm. if you were there when they needed somebody, you were hired. Doesn't necessarily mean that you were good at what you did or, or, or that you had a great background. You were just the right place at the right time. And, and, and they would beat you in submission or, or, or beat you to the point where you, you, you became, you, you understood what they wanted and you did it. Um, but the beating was always there. Um, <laughs> but today we want to make sure that we're hiring the right person for the right job uh, and putting them in a position where we can, we can train them. Because that, that's really an important part is training. And again, Training has, has no time limits when you think about it. I mean, you, you, you relate it to a, a, a child, and, and I don't know how many you have children, but when you're teaching your child how to swim, you've got floaties on their arms, you don't tell them they have two weeks to learn how to swim, and then you're going to take the floaties off, and the kid drowns. You know, it's, it's, well, that, it's your fault. You know, you didn't learn how to swim in two weeks. I mean, it could, take, it could take two months. It could take three months. The point is, once you hire a person, you have to be committed to that person 100%. Mm -hmm. And that training can take a while, and, and, but the commitment has to be there. And the commitment from them has to be there. And, and the deciding factor in that is when they have a hard day and you go to them and say, Walter, you know, you, you struggled today. What do you think about tomorrow? And the kid's got a smile on his face. and says, Chef, I'm going to get it tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. And, 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 and that show, shows a, a strong dedication, a strong will, and an attitude that they know in their mind that one day they'll get it. Mm -hmm. If you have the patience and persistence to, to continue working with them, they'll get it one day. And believe me, when they get it, it's an extraordinary thing to watch because it's like turning a light on. One day they'll come in and it's just, it's like night and day. And then that person that you've spent the time with, that you've dedicated that training moment, you've given him what he needs or she needs. You know, Walter was with us for, for six and a half years. Uh, an extraordinary young chef who today now is a chef de cuisine in another restaurant. Um, and, then, and then the point is, so if you hired, you trained, and, and, and then you have to mentor them. And mentorship is something that goes beyond, beyond work. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a process, it's a life process. And the point is, if you've hired correctly, if you trained correctly, and you mentored correctly, then the result of that is that, that you have somebody who is better than you are. And, and that was, that's a hard thing for a lot of chefs to say, is that person is better than I am. But if they're not, then you really haven't done your job very well, have you? I mean, they have to be better than you are. You have to give them a better environment. You have to give them better skills. You have to give them better tools to work with. You have to give them a better education. And you have to give them better opportunity than you ever had. And if you do all those things, then, then the, the overarching goal that we talked about is raising the, the standards of, the, of our profession have been achieved. I know that there are some fantastic questions in the audience, so I do okay. want to open up for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and someone with a microphone will find you. My question is about, you, you've been quoted to, to speak about the importance of ownership in every person in the restaurant, and you've said that you don't work for somebody your whole life and then suddenly wake up one morning and think like an owner. Right. Could you talk about what you've done to instill that um, in people at your restaurant, given that it is a high turnover industry? Yeah, yeah, it's funny because we don't really have a high turnover as much as is, you know, it is a high turnover industry. Our turnover really occurs when, when there's not the ability for somebody to be promoted. And that's typically because you know, as, as, as it's a pyramid and as you get up towards the top, those individuals are staying longer. So you know, as a Comey goes to a chef de partie, a chef de partie goes to demi sous chef, demi sous chef goes to sous chef, sous chef goes to executive sous chef, and then goes to the CDC, there are fewer and fewer people. So, Typically, somebody will leave after two or two and a half years at the chef de partie level. But to, to answer your question, we're preparing them to be a chef de cuisine. And we're preparing them to be a chef de cuisine because we begin them as a comi. So at that level, at that beginning level, they're understanding the foundation of the kitchen, really. Understanding the true foundation uh, of how to operate a kitchen, open a kitchen, what, 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 the, what the fundamental practices are, how to do, how to do the fundamental work. Um, and, and at the same time, they get to work with a chef de partie. A chef de partie is somebody who actually is responsible for a station, you know, fish, meat, vegetable, um, cheese, whatever the different stations are in the restaurant. So you've created this, this, this team environment. 
and the chef de partie is, is now working with that, with that comi or that group of comis and, 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 and supervising them, and managing them in a way that they are actually understanding what it is to be a chef because now they have their own little small team that they de we define the menus, they define their dishes, and then they start to write out their list of, of, of tasks that have to be done. And they have to then, then motivate, supervise their commis in order to get the, the, the task completed in the, in the appropriate amount of time. So as a chef de partie, you're learning, you, and, and back up a little bit, as a commis, your next position would be a chef de partie. So you're learning as a commis what it's like to be managed by somebody at that, fo at that foundation and then you're promoted to the chef de partie position, so now the roles are reversed. You understand what you need to do at the, in those positions, so as a chef de partie, you understand how to manage and supervise that position. So we're teaching them how to be chefs, little mini chefs in their stations before they ever become a sous chef. And if you, begin, you get to become a sous chef, then you're now responsible for a group of chef de parties, not for all the chef de parties, but for a group of chef de parties. So you're managing or supervising even, even more people. If you get to be an executive sous chef, the executive sous chef is the same as a chef de cuisine. In other words, he's responsible for the entire kitchen and understanding how to, how to supervise and manage that group. And then as a chef de cuisine, obviously you're responsible for the entire kitchen. Now, if you start to revert to what, what it is to operate a business, it's not just about the kitchen. I mean, the kitchen is a very important part of any restaurant, but it's, it's, not, it's, it, 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 it's not the area where you're going to find success in being a, a, a business owner. And, and, and that was evident, as I spoke earlier, me being a really good chef didn't, make, didn't qualify me to run a business. In fact, it qualified me to run a business into the ground and be unsuccessful. <laughs> so, so understanding that, you know, at that point, when they become the executive chef, even when they become a sous chef, they start to understand human resources. They, they start to understand public relations. They start to understand uh, uh, the, uh, the, the finances so that they can start, start to formulate what it is that they are impacting. So as, as they begin to order food, they understand you know, how, how to keep inventories, um, how to price inventories, uh, they understand how to, not, how to manage inventories. Um, and then uh, the, more, the, the further up they go as an executive sous chef and as uh, executive sous chef and chef, and chef de cuisine, now are in the budgetary process. So every year, they are actually writing their budgets for, for, for their department, so we're actually teaching them how to be these owners before their owners. And that's, that's really what I want to be able to do. And, and then as they start to, to, to understand that, they're working in human resources and public relations as well, so they have really the three criteria that they need in order to understand how to open their own restaurant. And then, and then understanding that there's a transitional period. I know if I walk into my kitchen today and I said, who wants to open their own restaurant? 95% of those hands are going to go up. So knowing immediately that everybody in my restaurant, in my kitchen, is going to leave someday prepares me for these transitions. So understanding that as a chef de cuisine, that, that chef wants to open his own restaurant. So we begin early in the process so that we have a, a, a smooth transition process for him to be able to not only learn what he needs to learn about running a restaurant, but now how to open a restaurant. So we can offer that person uh, not only the financial uh, information needs, but, but also legal uh, to help him understand how to write a business plan and preparing him for that. So the ownership, is, it, it becomes something that is very tangible for them at, at, a, at a very early age in, in, in their career at our restaurants because they are owning it even though they may not realize it. So that when someone leaves our restaurant, even at, even at a young age, even at a young position, at a chef de partie's position, they've, they've already tasted and felt what it's like to be a chef. Right here. Hi, uh, Hi, my name is Candice Corvetti. I'm a first year MBA. I was just curious what right now your favorite thing to cook is. My, right now? Um, we have some beautiful white asparagus that's right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like right now. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. We were talking about this a little earlier about, you know, ab about in ingredients and, and how, and I mean, they are the most important part of what we do. And, and, and the seasonality of them, we, we realize that, that proteins are, are, are very easy, right? I mean, we, we forecast our proteins every week. We, we don't necessarily forecast our vegetables every week. We know that you know, uh, our, our, our duck producer is going to produce ducks for us every week. We know our lammer's got lamb. We know our, 
uh, you know, our, our ranch in, in Idaho has, has beef for us. We know, you know, that the fish we're going to get, you know, we know, we'll, we'll, mostly we know what we're going to get. If we can't get cod this week, we'll get another fish, but we know we can get these different proteins. It's really, it really, we really build our menus around the vegetables because vegetables have a defined season. We all think of seasons, seasonality as, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, but that, that, that has nothing to do with the seasonality that we deal with because a fava bean for us may only have a season of three and a half or four weeks. We may see fava beans in the market for three and a half months, but we know that the, the last two and a half months, those fava beans, you know, typically are overgrown and starchy and we don't really want to work with that. So really understanding the seasonality of each ingredient, and certainly in this aspect as it relates to vegetables. So right now, you know, the white asparagus that we're getting, the white asparagus we're getting right now is from, is from Germany, which, which arguably has some of the best white asparagus that's available because they have, they, they're, they're the northern, north of Germany, you, you think of the Scandinavian countries, they have white asparagus as well, but it's still a little too cold, so they don't get as, as meaty and as big. And then further south in France, it's, it's already getting too warm by the time their season hits. Germany has that wonderful, that wonderful season, that prime season when the temperatures are, are just right for the growing of asparagus in the size that we like and the texture that we like. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> but they won't be around much longer. <laughs> One more question over there. Hi, thanks for uh, coming here. It's really excited to have you. Um, to jump off on that question, uh, could you talk a little bit about your supply chain? Is a lot of it coming from local organic farms, or is it sort of worldwide? Um, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, you know, people talk about, there, there's all this, this talk recently about local, right? Everybody, has anybody heard, not heard that, you know, <laughs> local? Has anybody not heard the word sustainability in the, in the past three or four years? Um, you know, chefs have always been focused on, on quality ingredients, you know, and, and chefs have always been focused on, on, on our farmers, our suppliers. So this whole idea that farm to table is something new is a bit absurd and insulting to me, you know, because, you know, it's something that we've, that every chef in every generation, any chef that's, that, that's been worth anything has always been, had relationships with, with their farmers, their fishermen, their foragers, their gardeners. I mean, those, those individuals are, are who we rely on. I mean, we, we truly support them uh, in, in what they do in, in every way. Um, and, and local has nothing to do with geography. I mean, where did, where did this idea come from that we have to use products within 25 miles? I mean, what, is, what, I mean, what defines local anyway? Is local, <laughs> you look at the dictionary, what is local? Can anybody define it for me? I was, I, was, I was doing a lecture a couple weeks ago and some woman said well, it was 25 miles. And I'm like, okay, so 25 miles, right? So that means if this farmer is growing a carrot within 25 miles, I can buy it. And if it's a shitty carrot, that's okay. <laughs> it's local. But if there's a guy 27 miles away that's growing the most amazing carrot that, that you've ever tasted, I can't buy that carrot. And by the way, what are you drinking? Coffee? Is there, is, is, is there a coffee plantation 25 miles from here? Like, you know, <laughs> like what's that about? I mean, we have a, we, you know, we, we, we live with a little bit of hypocrisy, all of us do. So if we believe we're truly buying local ingredients, but we're drinking tea or coffee or sugar or using vanilla or oil or, you know, any of these things, I mean, you tell me, you tell me where, where these farms are, or where these producers are that are producing all these things locally. You know, and what is local anyway? Is it 25, is it 50, is it 100, is it 200, is it 300 miles, you know, around? I, I have no idea what that lo what local means. So local to me has to do with ingredients. And we realize that the culinary diversity of the world has been based on transportation, right? Do we agree on that? I mean, the most famous country in the world for chocolate is where? Switzerland. Do they have any cocoa plantations in Switzerland? I don't think so. The Italians are known for what, tomatoes? Tomatoes came from the New World, right? They didn't come from Italy. The Italians never. Potatoes. The Irish potato famine in the 1600s, right? They got the potatoes from, from, from Peru. I mean, it wasn't something that they had locally. It was brought there by, by, by somebody from a boat. So the, the, the spice roots you know, of, 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 of ancient times. I mean, this, is, this has been the makeup of our culinary heritage for centuries. For, for, and it's not going to stop. So why would we say we're not going to support any longer the, 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 the coffee bean plantations in, in South America or Sumatra? Or we're not going to support the, 
the vanilla bean plantations in, in, in Mexico or Tahiti. I mean, would we really do that? Would we put out, would we put out of business these communities that have been thriving for decades or centuries on the idea of exporting their food? And then how many of you drink wine? And does anybody drink French wine? Would well, you think that comes from local? <laughs> I, you know, all these different things, it, it, it just fascinates me that local has been, has, ha, has been defined as something that is within a certain proximity. Local is about the ingredients and the quality of the ingredients. To me, that's what it's all about. It's about communities that are producing food for us. And, and we talk about sustainability. And sustainability has nothing to do with ingredients. Sustainability has to do with communities. Communities are very important. So if I'm buying my ingredients from the right individuals they're, they're the ones that are gonna be concerned about the sustainability of their ingredients. I buy, I buy lobsters from Ingrid Benjes, who lives in Stonington, Maine. Does anybody know where Stonington, Maine is? Has anybody been to Stonington, Maine? There you go. If, if, if that community of fishermen had to rely on selling their fish and their lobsters within a certain proximity to that town, that community would not exist. There would not be the, 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 the fishermen there. There would not be the teachers there or the doctors there or the pharmacists there. There would not be a community in Stonington, Maine if they couldn't transport their local ingredients elsewhere. And then they're worried about the sustainability. This is a community that's been there for generations. They're the ones that, 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 are, that are monitoring the quality of their harvesting of the, of the lobsters or the scallops. Because every year for 30 years, I've been buying lobsters and scallops and cod, things from, from Ingrid Benjes, right? Okay? And she buys them from her fishermen. So there's a sustainability in the community. And those fishermen are the ones that are worried about the sustainability of, of what they're harvesting. So I shouldn't really have to worry about the sustainability of those ingredients or, or the locality of them, other than we're supporting people who are, who, are doing, who are doing work that has been going on for generations and supporting a community around them. Did I answer your question? I also, or, or organic, uh, I'm sorry, organic is, that doesn't matter. I, I, it doesn't matter to me because, again, we buy ingredients for, for, their, for the flavor and for the quality of the ingredient. And, and, and sometimes our ingredients that aren't organic are much better than something that's labeled organic. And if I'm going to tell my, my farmer in Yonville that he has to get certified organic, from the state of California. So he's, for five years, he's gonna have to monitor his, have to send in every six months or every three months his test results, which cost him money. He's gonna have to wait for the state to verify that and then, and then give him a stamp on a piece of paper that says he's organic. When he's been, when he's been farming, this, his father farmed the farm and his grandfather farmed the farm and they've always been practicing organic. You know what he's gonna tell me, right? He's gonna go tell me to stick it because, you know, he doesn't need to be involved in the bureaucracy of the state certifying his property organic when he's been farming organic for, for generations. Sorry. Great. No, it, it's clear you've thought a lot about the topic. Yeah. So I want to close with a question that's asked at many of you from the top oh. engagements. The current GSB application includes an essay that asks, what matters most to you and why? How would you respond to that question? I, you know, I think what matters most to me now is, is, is really education. Mm -hmm. um, I think education is, is, um, is, the, is the tool for success in, in, in anything we do in life. And, um, you know, our profession was one that we were told how to do something for so long and not necessarily why. Uh, and, you know, it's only been recently in, in my career span, the past 25 years, that we've, we've actually learned why we've actually become more knowledgeable on, on the science of food, right? You've all seen a lot of things. Harold McGee wrote a book 30 years ago called, you know, On, on Food and Cooking, which really opened up uh, so much knowledge for, for so many cooks who never understood, you know, why an emulsification worked. You know, what was it, what was the property in the fat of an egg yolk and the oil that brought it together, and how much could you do? And, 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 and it was the knowledge that opened up a lot of doors for us, and, and I would say that what we want to be able to do, to do is, is, is to share that knowledge uh, with everybody, to, to help impact uh, and enrich people's lives. And, and certainly in, in my profession, it's, it's been an extraordinary rise in, in knowledge and, and understanding of what we do and why we do it, that in America today, 
we live with a culinary culture today that is only 30 years old. And we have achieved enormous success, notoriety, and, and reputation because of the knowledge that we have and the dedication we have to our craft and, 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 and to each other. I think those are important things. Great, thanks for sharing. Yeah. So before we finish, I understand that you have a surprise yeah. for people in the audience. We do, there, there's a story about green, green tape. Has anybody heard the green tape story? No. Oh, one person heard the green tape story. So, you know, as I told you, when we were opening Per Se, we took 30 individuals from French Army to Per Se to help inoculate this, this group of people in, at, in New York City with our culture and our philosophy. And so I gave them all this, this you know, this big rah-rah speech about, you know, you're gonna go there, you're gonna meet people, it's New York City, we wanna make sure that we teach, you know, this new staff who we are. Give them the examples of who we are. Find something, find a way to, to, to just make it better a little bit. You know, find something that's gonna impact them. Find something that's gonna say something to these individuals in New York. And we had a young expediter uh, named Zion Cruel, I think he was probably 23, 24 years old at the time, who worked at the French Laundry. Now the green tape was something that we use at our restaurant, and I began using it in 1994. It's painter's tape, right? And, and, and we use it to label everything in the restaurant. And the reason we use green tape is because masking tape, which is typically used, or labels, which are typically used, have such a strong adhesive that when you take them off, it leaves a residue on the container. I hated that. I, I, you know, it just drove me crazy. Green tape it has, has a very uh, light adhesive, so that when you take it off, nothing stays on the container. So every container, everything that's marked at the restaurant is marked with green tape. Every time we tape down the pass, which means we put a tablecloth on the pass, the table that we plate our food on, it's taped down with green tape. For 10 years, an entire decade, hundreds of people tore the green tape, right? We would just tear it. Grant Ackett's, Jonathan Benno, Sebastian Roxel, Eric Ziebold, I mean, dozens of chefs today, dozens of people in our profession today, Paul Roberts, sommelier, I mean, you know, manage, everybody. Nobody thought about doing anything else but tearing the green tape. Zion Cruel, who taped on the pass at the French Laundry every day for two years, shows up in New York City. On February 16th, 2004, the first day he's taping down the pass for the first service at Per Se, what does he do? Picks up a pair of scissors and cuts the green tape. Everybody in the entire restaurant was like, what? <laughs> what just happened? And, and from that moment on, 600 other employees, where there's a roll of green tape, there's a pair of scissors. And it just goes to show you how big of an impact one person can have just with the idea that they're gonna make a difference. And it wasn't a big thing, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't such, when you think about it, it's like, okay, well, whatever, he picked up a pair of scissors and cut the green tape. It's not, it's not such a stretch, is it? But he did it. He thought about it. He made an impact. He had the confidence and he had the courage to pick up a pair of scissors and cut the green tape. And now I have over a thousand people that work at TKRG and everywhere there's a roll of green tape, there's a pair of scissors. And now they have actually dispensers so they don't have to get the pair of scissors. <laughs> I don't know where the dispenser came from but somebody thought about the dispenser. So with that said, there is three pieces. I hope it's cut green tape, thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's three pieces of green tape under your chair, okay? So there are three chairs with a piece of green tape under it. And um, we want to be able to give you something from us. So whoever has a piece of green tape, let me know. Do you remember where you put them? Yes. Did anybody find green anybody tape? Anybody find green tape? Oh, we've oh, got yeah. one. Where? Two. Right here. And, then we have another. and back there. And there's Where's the, the third? Side. And we have three. You have three? Yeah, we have three. Okay, come on. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. <laughs>